Thank you very much uh, for attending. Um, we are going to have a bit of an introduction to the workshop. Then you're going to have a presentation from each of us on different topics, with the idea being that this should let you think about and consider how we make uh, zoo research better in terms of its quality, its reliability and its repeatability. So um, my name is Dr Paul Rose. I am current co-chair of the Biaza Research Committee and it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr Andrew Mooney from Dublin Zoo and uh, Dr Ricardo Figueredo from uh, Bristol Zoo Project. And we are all active zoo researchers that have experience with the challenges that science in the zoo brings. But we don't believe that's a barrier to doing good quality science. So that's the kind of main aim and thrust of um, this evening. So without further ado, I will just do the very brief introductory presentation that explains the running order, and then I will hand over um, to Andrew, who's going to be giving the first presentation of the evening. OK, so hopefully slides have now appeared on your screen. So the idea of enhancing the image of zoo science is all about the valid, open and ethical practices that we as researchers um, should be using, should be implementing in our day to day running of all zoo based projects. And we wanted to talk about this uh, subject to dispel some of the myth, dare I say, some of the academic snobbery that goes alongside of zoo science to make it something that is considered as credible and as relevant as lab based or larger field based approaches. So we'll be covering three broad topics. Um, Andrew will be up first by talking about open science practices, particularly the sharing of data and the positive way in which that makes zoo science uh, more repeatable as as well as science generally more repeatable. And he's also going to give you some hints and tips on what to do well and things to avoid. Then I'm going to talk a bit about being credible as a researcher and being uh, better, if as it were, in what we do and how we explain what we do so people can clearly follow uh, our practices. Some of you may have heard of the replication crisis that we currently have in the biological sciences, um, so that will be a broad theme of my talk. And last but by no means least, uh, Ricardo is going to come along and he is going to talk about multi-zoo studies and the challenges of multi-zoo studies simply because he has done this very recently for his PhD as well as some of the work that he does for his new role at Bristol Zoo, uh, the Bristol Zoo project. So he's going to round up the evening with the last talk on these kind of bigger projects that we need to do that allow us to collect more data. OK, so thanks for that um, introduction, Paul, and I think Something to really keep in mind is that this is not just about zoo science, this is science in general. Um, all of the practices we're talking about apply to loads of different disciplines, so you can take whatever you want from this and apply it to whatever area you're working in, um, even if that is in zoo science. So yeah, um, I'm Andrew Mooney and I'm the Conservation and Research Officer here at Dublin Zoo in Ireland, and I'm also the Vice Chair of the Biaza Research Committee. And before my role um, at Dublin Zoo, I was actually the research data officer with the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. And this evening, I'm going to chat a little bit about open science and in particular open and what we call fair data. We're all used to hearing a lot about open science in terms of open access journals, but we really need to put the same attention and effort into making our data open too. And hopefully by the end of this, you'll be convinced and you'll be sharing all of your data too and using lots of the other open data as well. I think the best way to kind of kick off is to start with um, a bit of an example. So, um, Jonathan Pruitt is a great example of what not to do with your data. Um, he was a prominent researcher in the world of behavioural ecology in McMaster University in Canada, and he had a particular focus on spider behaviour, hence the beautiful spider here. But in 2020, concerns were raised when people found irregularities in some of his data. So here's an example of some of the data he published um, alongside of some of his papers. 
And the kind of irregularities are highlighted here. So have a quick glance at it and see if you can spot anything kind of weird. Um, and what you're looking at here is each row is an individual spider and left is before treatment and right is after treatment. Um, and you can find all this online. It's a very public story. So I'm not just singling out Jonathan because I hate him. Um, it's a very public uh, way that data has been used to keep science um, integrity. So yeah, have a quick look um, and let's kind of chat through what you're seeing and what people found out because of it. Because it actually turns out that Jonathan Pruitt was fabricating data. And what you're seeing here is that he actually duplicated entire strings of numbers in his data set. So completely made up data. So for example, here you can see that the last two pre-treatment columns matched really well with the first two post-treatment columns. And these are down to the 100th of a second. So clearly something didn't line up. So for example, um, in this case, the exact numbers before were the exact same as the first two after as well. And statistically, this is incredibly improbable. So this raised a lot of concerns um, around the validity of his data. So again, huge chunks were just completely copy and pasted from before and after. And also for the ones in yellow, he was really obvious in what he did as well. He added a number to the front of the yellow ones afterwards. So instead of being 77.56, it went to 477.56. Instead of 212.22, he went to 412.22. And this is obviously terrible science. The data itself are completely fake. Um, but what's worse is that he actually gave a lot of his fake data to other people. And even worse again, is that if you remove all of this kind of fake data that's in there and all these repetitive numbers, all the numbers that are left over show no significant difference in spider behavior between these experimental treatments. So he was basically creating all of his own fake data to give him the experimental results he wanted in the end. And this was a huge ordeal once it was uncovered. And since then, 15 of his own scientific publications have been retracted completely. And the University of Tennessee has withdrawn his own PhD dissertation, so he's no longer um, a doctor. Um, however, others also lost out a lot and had their own papers retracted because of him and his fake data. And in 2022, he officially resigned from McMaster University and he's now a high school teacher in Florida, which makes a lot of sense. Um, but it's, it's a really good example. Um, and it's just one example of why managing and interrogating research data is such an important part of the scientific process. Similar examples from human medicine have put people's lives at risk and resulted in things like criminal investigations and press and, and charges. And that is why we take research data management and integrity so seriously. And really, we call all of this research data management. And it's just everything from how you organize and store and preserve and share your data during the lifetime of a project, but also then the longer term kind of implications around what you do with your data once it's done and how we preserve and share it after a project has been completed. And like I said, just like traditional publications, we're seeing a movement in research away from closed data and um, towards open access and open data in general, increasing reproducibility and opportunities for future research and discovery. So it is an involving area, but we're seeing real world implications of what all of this actually means in terms of the scientific process. And before we jump in, I just want to exactly define what research data are. So this is um, an EU example of what we call research data, because it might seem very simple, but according to the EU, research data means documents in a digital form other than publications which are collected or produced in the course of a research activities or are used as evidence in the research process or are commonly accepted in the community as necessary to validate findings and results. And that's a really long winded way of saying that it's anything except publications or physical samples that we're using in research. Now, in general, we all have an idea of an Excel spreadsheet filled with numbers as being our data. But data can also include things like interview transcripts, photos, videos, audio files, and lots of other things in between, depending on what research you do. So really, this definition can mean lots of different things for different disciplines. But ultimately, at a very high level, it's just any kind of digital document that you have that is necessary to support or validate your findings within a project. 
And for us in the zoo community, this really is very diverse. We deal with veterinary records, we deal with records from Zims, we do audio recordings. Um, there's a lot of different disciplines that go into zoo research and all of them come with different types of data that we should be aware of. And a separate kind of question that we need to look at then is if we're going to create new data or if we're going to reuse any existing data. As a global zoo and aquarium community, there are lots of different resources we can use with readily available data already. And a good example of that is Species 360 and ZIMS, where we have global data being shared from zoos all around the world. Um, in this case, we don't need to create our own new data, but we still need to be careful what license these data are coming with. And it's still important to mention that reusing any of these existing data like ZIMS data doesn't make them exempt from things like data protection regulations and any other policies that you must comply with, either with university or with your funder, etc. So we have data now. Let's say we've gone out and done our project. We have all this data. Why do we actually care about managing our research data and why are we going to invest time into it? And firstly, you might not know it yet, but many funders and publishers have very strict management policies around data that you'll have to comply with if you want to get funding or publish your work. So here, good research data management can actually help you get funding and get published. And more and more funders are asking for you to share your data as a requirement of getting the funding from the actual funder as well. And by managing your data correctly and recording all the necessary details about where it came from and what you did with it, you're helping to ensure research integrity, which is also a good thing. You're also just saving yourself time and resources in the long run, increasing your own overall efficiency. Uh, managing your data will also help to increase data security and minimize the risk of losing your data. I think we've all been in a case where we've managed to lose a file or delete it accidentally, but good research data management can help minimize that. It can also help um, help others to try and replicate your findings, which as Paul mentioned, we're facing a reproducibility and replicability crisis in science. And again, you may not realize it, but data themselves can actually be published in a journal, just like your research article, but completely separately. And there are now data exclusive journals out there just so you can publish your data set and describe it. And lastly, by managing and sharing your data, you are making it available for other people, which can lead to some amazing discoveries. And a perfect example we use in research data management is COVID-19. Um, during COVID-19, we saw a huge increase of publications coming out really, really quickly. And a lot of the advancements we were seeing in COVID-19 and COVID-19 testing were relying on publicly shared data from COVID researchers around the world. So it had real-time health implications for the entire global population. So really, the benefits of good research data management are almost endless, and it is something you should be spending at least a little bit of time thinking about and planning before you go and actually do a research project um, in the zoo. But how do you actually manage your data is a different question on a day-to-day -day basis. It's all great saying we need to do these things and there's loads of benefits from it, um, but how do we actually implement that on a day-to-day? -day? And some of the most basic things to consider that we often take for granted as researchers, um, especially in universities, are just looking at things like file formats, file naming, folder structure, and version control really boring things and something I think we all think we know a lot about, but actually when you take a step back and look at it, it's not as simple as it seems. So even just when it comes to file formats, you really should be using open and standard formats because they're going to facilitate sharing and long-term reuse of your data. So for example, if you're working with numerical data in spreadsheets, the go-to is always an Excel file, but you don't realize that you actually need a Microsoft subscription to access that file. So if you're going to share your data, if it's in numerical format, you should really be going for a CSV format as that's the most standard and open format um, which will enable your data to be used by others without limiting them to a Microsoft subscription as well. And depending on what type of data you're working with, there are global standards in place which we recommend that you use um, and you can check them online. And in terms of file naming, um, Having worked with students in universities, I can tell you that file naming is a minefield, but ultimately all files and folders should be labeled and organized in a systematic and consistent way so that they're easy to find for you and anyone else who tries to reuse your data. 
And this might sound really silly and simple, but how many of you can actually say you're using a systematic file naming convention? Um, it's generally recommended for files and folders to be concise, um, but informative enough to contain the contents of the file. So common elements that you should be thinking about when naming files are project acronyms, version numbers, dates, contributors, um, content descriptions, things like that. And similar to file naming conventions, a meaningful folder structure is also a key element of project and data management and will make it much easier for you to actually locate and organize all your data and documents to go along with them. And again, it's something we don't really think about or plan in advance, it just often happens. But really for good science, we should be planning how we're going to store and manage our data on a day to day. And finally, managing different versions of your data can be tricky, but version control is a key step in data management and project management overall. And I know I'm completely guilty of this as well, where you'll have multiple versions of a data set and you're not quite sure which one is the correct one or the most current one or what the differences are between them. So really what you should be doing is looking at different ways of recording versions of your data. And you can use systematic naming conventions for this. So things like putting the date in the file name, version number in the file name, or even using something um, like a version control table where you have a separate document detailing what each version of a document uh, is and what changes you made throughout the process as well. And it might sound, oh, this is really boring, um, but in terms of research data management, there are requirements that are coming down the line in terms of funders and how you do this. And especially if you're dealing with any kind of sensitive human data, this is a mandatory requirement. It's not just something that you should be doing as well. Um, and so, OK, you have your data now and hopefully it's really structured and nicely named. Um, do you know where it is? Um, you can easily store your data on lots of things like USB, laptop, in your emails, external hard drives or even in the cloud. Um, and in reality, it is recommended that you use multiple different storage solutions um, at the same time. Having your data in a single location always poses a risk and backups are an important part of ensuring that your data and all the related files can be restored if you lose or damage um, your device. So most of the common causes of data loss that we see are things like hardware failure or human error. And almost all of them can be prevented or minimized through active data backup policies. Um, and in general, what we recommend as kind of the standard is that you have three different copies of your data um, stored them in two different media. So maybe one on your laptop, one in the cloud and have them in different physical locations. So don't have your USB stick and your laptop in the same office because if the office is up in flames, then all your data is gone. And luckily for you, most cloud computing storage solutions and universities um, offer automatic backups of files and folders on your computer to the cloud. So in this way, you really have two copies on different media in different locations. So I would always suggest looking at what your university organization offers in terms of data backup as well. And apart from your actual data itself, um, you should also be recording all of the necessary documentation to help both you and others understand and interpret your data. Let's say you have to revisit a project you did five years ago and you need to reanalyze all of the data. Would you understand all of your files and documents? Um, I'd be very surprised if you could honestly say you could because I honestly can't. Um, but, but good quality data documentation will allow you to understand what you did to the data and will allow others to also understand what you did to your data. So if they have to come back and analyze your data, they can as well. So in addition to the data itself, you should also be recording relevant documentation such as interview protocols, questionnaires, code books, consent forms, and any other relevant kind of documentation that you think is needed to interpret your data. If you have all of this additional information recorded alongside and in the same place as your data, then actually interpreting the data itself is a lot easier for you and anyone else who does come along. But I guess the kind of the crux of what we're really talking about here is sharing data and making your data as open as possible. So the next step is actually then once you've done your project, you've created your publication, you've published it, great. Um, you also want to think about sharing your data itself. And this is where a lot of researchers get um, quite scared, I think. Um, you put a lot of effort and time into earning your data and generating it and analyzing it as well. And there is concern that sharing your data is risky or you could lose something by doing it. 
But really, this is all a part of just being good at science. Um, many of the data sets we're generating have huge value beyond using them for the original research project. And all of the data we reuse in our experiments from other sources is a great example of that. And there are lots of benefits to you as a researcher as well. Um, the main one, again, being research integrity and reproducibility. The majority of published articles today are not reproducible. And a lot of that comes from a lack of data sharing around the original articles too. So by making your data open, we're making our research more reproducible in the future as well. Um, preservation of research data. If you've spent years, if you're doing a PhD collecting data, you need to make sure that your data is safe and data sharing is a really good way of actually preserving your data long term. Innovation, so example like the COVID uh, example I gave, but also things like the Human Genome Project. That was a huge development and all of that was based off of the data sharing agreement between loads of different researchers. Impact as well, so um, by sharing your data, you can actually get more citations and your research can be shared more widely as well. An ex example of that is data specific journals. And finally, again, funder and publisher requirements. So sometimes it's not a benefit to share your data, but you legally have to, um, or you are under obligation to by working with your funder or publisher as well. So how, how do we actually share our data? I think most of us know a lot about that we should do it, but what does that look like in practice and what are different steps you can take? And there's not just one way to share data, there are a few different ones. So for example, the first one is just making the data available through you as a person. Um, this is perhaps the least preferable option as it means that it requires someone to reach out to you. So if anything happens, you or the data, then it's all gone forever. So you can do that, but it's not recommended. And um, the second one and probably the most common one that we see at the minute is including data as supplementary files with the article itself. So when you go and look at a research article online, at the end, you'll see some extra files you can download with all of the data. And this is a better option as the data are secured long term, but it means that the data themselves are not citable um, and are often harder to find as well by researchers. Thirdly, you can publish your data in a data specific journal as well. So just like your traditional papers, you can make the publication out of your data in a data specific journal. And this makes the data more citable and findable and all of those things. However, it's very time consuming and it's not always suitable um, for the type of projects that you're dealing with. And that's why by far the most preferable option for data sharing is to make your data available in an open access data archive or repository. This is the gold standard of research data sharing. Um, and there's a lot of potential there for you as well as a researcher to find new data for yourself to use as well. So how do we find our data repository? And thankfully, it's actually relatively easy. A lot of the different data repositories are super easy to use. They're basically just websites which store your data and make it openly available for other people to use. And there are thousands of data repositories out there, and many of them are discipline specific or they can be more general. But regardless of the subject, you just need to make sure that whichever repository you're using is trustworthy and is able to meet community standards, basically. So it should have information, allow access, have licenses, persistent identifiers, and all these other things that are community standards for open science and open data. And if you have no idea where to start uh, to find a data repository, then re3data.org is a really good resource. Um, it's a registry of more than 3,000 different research databases, all of which um, comply with these community standards. And one particular one that I would always recommend is Zenodo. Zenodo welcomes research from all over the world, from almost every possible discipline. And most importantly, Zenodo is completely free for you to use as a researcher, um, and it's also free for you to access to download other people's data as well. So if you're not really sure where to go, Zenaid, Zenodo is a kind of anything goes kind of data repository while also complying with all of these standards too. And data repositories have numerous different benefits. Um, they basically do all of the hard work for you in terms of making your data open and able to conform with these community standards. And they provide things like persistent identifiers, licenses, security, access, um, and they're normally free for us to use. Uh, some of the ones uh, you have to pay to use or to upload your data or access other people's data, and they're not 
the most fair or open resources. So we would kind of steer away from those. Um, but things like Zenodo are completely free to use, which makes them really, really useful as a tool to get new data as well. And really all of this um, is kind of summarized on what we call the fair data principles, which say that all research data that you do in a zoo um, or anything anywhere else, any other project should be findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. This is an industry standard across loads of different disciplines, and it is adopted at an EU level now as well, and is recommended by all of the big EU funders. Um, and we're slowly starting to see a trickle down into national um, legislation as well, at least we are here in Ireland and in the UK. So if you can make your data fair, um, then you're ticking all the boxes straight away. So what does findable data um, actually look like, and how do you make your data findable? So it, it might seem kind of silly, but it's easy for you to find your data, but it should also be possible for me and any other computer system to find your data as well. And this means that um, a description of your data, what we call metadata, should be available online in a searchable resource like Zenodo, and that the data should be uh, have a persistent identifier. So a DOI is an example of a persistent identifier. So if you look at a research article that often have a DOI number, that's just a digital object identifier, which is unique to that publication. But here, your data will get its own DOI number as a unique entity in itself, just like your publication will. So you'll have two DOIs. And if you're using a trusted and um, commonly used digital repository like Zenodo, then when you upload your data, it'll automatically do all of this for you. And you don't need to think about any of it. Um, it's already ticking all those boxes, like I said. And secondly, you should ask, is your data accessible? It should be possible for, again, me and machines to gain access to your data under specific conditions or restrictions if necessary. And I'll touch on this again towards the end. But a lot of the time, you'll be able to easily make your data openly accessible. Um, but FAIR doesn't mean that your data themselves need to be open and available all of the time. And of course, this is a very important thing to consider if you're dealing with any form of personal data which under GDPR, for example, can't be shared out explicit and informed consent. But even if that is the case, um, you can still share metadata around your data. So I can publish a description of my data set without actually making the data set itself available. So there's always a persistent identifier like a DOI, even if the data themselves aren't always accessible. And thirdly, you need to ask yourself, are my data interoperable? And again, can someone come along and actually use my data set if they find it? Data and metadata should conform to recognized formats and standards to allow them to be combined and exchanged. So again, this means that data should be provided in commonly understood and preferably open formats. Um, so example, thinking back to like an Excel spreadsheet versus a CSV file. One of those is an open format. One of them requires third party software to operate as well. And uh, again, these community standards are all out there for us to find online. So depending on what data you're working with, you can check um, whether it's JPEGs or PNGs or MP4 files. There's always a recommended version for you to use to make your data open and accessible. And finally, you need to ask yourself, are your data actually reusable? And this means that lots of documentation is needed to support the interpretation and reuse of your data. So for example, there should be sufficient documentation to allow someone to fully understand your data, where it came from and what has been done to it. So again, just think if you found a random data set or Excel spreadsheet, what would you need to be able to reuse that data in a scientific study? Whatever you're thinking, you should be able to provide that for your own data set when you go to store it somewhere. And most importantly here, the data should be clearly licensed so others know what kinds of reuse are permitted. And there are lots of different licenses out there, again, that you can choose from. But again, if you pick a reputable data repository, then they'll usually be able to apply a license to your data for you. So again, you don't need to think about any of it. Um, so what does this look like in practice? Here is what I would like to think is a good example of open and fair data in Zenodo. So it's a crowdsourced data set of air traffic from the Open Sky Network. Not very zoo related, but you can find good zoo examples as well on Zenodo, um, which again, you can use these data sets yourself if you want. And the first thing you can see is that the authors are already um, have linked the data set to their ORCID account. So that's a, a researcher ID account to link all of your publications and data sets together. Secondly, you can see how many people have actually viewed and downloaded your data. And this is a really good metric of seeing how 
valuable your data is and how other people can actually find value and use in it. Thirdly, again, you can see the DOI has been published here through Zenodo. So again, your data here has its own digital object identifier to make it unique from your publications, providing a long lasting and citable reference to the data set. Uh, fourthly, then we can see that the authors have assigned here a CCBY Creative Commons license, and we're not going to go into any detail around that. But basically, it means that whoever finds this, once they click that link, they can see that they are free to share, copy, or reuse and adapt the data for any purpose, in this case, even commercially, as long as they give appropriate credit and provide a link to this license and to this DOI. And lastly, the most important thing here is all of the extra information they provided here. They provided a thorough description of all of what the data set includes, including why they did the study, what happened to the data, what all the column names mean, all of these things are included here. So this is kind of the gold standard of what we should be aiming for for every one of the research projects we're involved in to be as open and fair as possible. And I touched on it before, but the last thing I want to kind of finish on is that although we're always encouraging you to be as open and share your data as much as possible, there are always going to be occasions where for legitimate reasons, we're not able to share some or all of our research data, such as working with personal data and aligned with data protection regulations. Similarly, your data could be commercially sensitive, have potential use for uh, intellectual property, and we call this as open as possible, but as closed as necessary. And isn't that you need to consider with respect to your own individual data set. Um, and ideally, you should be thinking about this before the project even begins. So thank you so much. Um, I'll stop now and we can take a short break, I think, Paul, if that's right. Okie doke. So hopefully um, you've now got some slides with a meerkat on them in front of you. And uh, what I'd like to talk about is this credibility in zoo research outputs, um, the importance of being credible in how we present our science to the world so others are able to follow precisely what we have done so that we can build a bigger body of literature that in the future is more useful to everybody that's trying to answer the same or similar research questions. So the key points for uh, this presentation focus around planning and preparation to ensure that your aims are clear. Thinking about how you use evidence from the literature in a way that shows uh, objective and unbiased approach. Being repeatable, supporting predictions, supporting what you aimed to do and writing out your hypotheses in a way that support your methods and really importantly show to the readers of your work why you have chosen particular analytical procedures. So it's really important that you choose the right types of statistical analysis according to the characteristics of your data. So I suppose the most important point I can start with and for any students in the audience, the one that you've probably had hammered home to you at university is to read the work of others widely. Cite from others in the research area that you are working in, but also cite from others that might be complementary to the work that you hope to do. So, for example, if you're a zoo animal behaviourist, there are papers in behavioural ecology that might be also relevant for you to consider. And when you become more experienced at publishing and when you build a larger bank of literature, it's really important that you look at the field as a whole and you keep abreast of all of the developments in the field. Don't just continuously cite your own work in a paper. Make sure you are citing the work of other people. Make sure you're looking to see what others are doing so that you are able to consider where does my work fit into the grander scheme of things. If you consistently cite your own work, you're not taking into account other perspectives and other ideas from the scientific literature. And this is also a really nice way to judge the quality of evidence. So when you write your introductions and when you write your discussions, look at the papers that you are using. If they continuously cite themselves or without consideration of other people that have worked in that area, 
that might be a bit of a red flag because all you are getting is the author's interpretation of that area of science. It's not bad or wrong to cite your own work in a paper, but we need to consider that in context of what everybody else is doing. And again, if you progress through the field, if you become an established scientist and you are asked to review the work of others, and that is how the peer review process works, all scientists are in this big club where we anonymously read each other's papers, we provide feedback on them, and that goes back to the journal that that author is hoping to publish in. Part of the peer review process is to state, is there any inappropriate self-citation? Do you think the author should have looked more broadly and more widely at the wider body of literature? So reading is not just for you to find information on your own work, it's also to find information on the work of others that supports what you are hoping to do. And I'd like to kind of really emphasise this point with a quote from Isaac Newton. So I, I'm not going off on a weird tangent here. Please don't. Please don't go and watch Coronation Street or something. But uh, Isaac Newton, 17th century uh, polymath, who was or 18th century, I can never remember. Um, he uh, was involved in so many fields. He was a scientist, he was a philosopher, he was a mathematician, but he gave the credit to other people. Even though he is um, linked with some enormous scientific discoveries of the age that he worked in, his most famous quote is, if I have seen further than others, it is by standing upon the shoulders of giants, i.e. science is cumulative, knowledge is gained and gathered over time and we add to that knowledge we don't own it it's not our property we should share it and we should acknowledge where it has come from so your science that you do adds to this increasing body of literature and by citing and by reading widely and by putting your work within the context of what other people are doing you're being ethical you're being unbiased and you're being objective. You're basically being a modern day Isaac Newton by acknowledging that where you are at now is because of this collective greater good that everybody has worked towards and that everybody has published. That means your work has more impact. And whether or not you are in the audience today and you are an undergraduate student, you are a postdoc, your PhD, you're an established academic, you're an in-zoo researcher, all of your work has impact. The smallest case study will have impact somewhere. Impact your institution, impact on the animals, impact to zoo operations, impact to the wider world of academia, whatever. But that impact is greatest if we are all Isaac Newtons, if we do acknowledge where the precedent has come from and we put into context, put into context how our work fits into that precedent. So impact is when others will use your work and when they apply what you have found into practice. So it's always better to think about the audience of any paper that you would like to publish. Who is going to read it? Who do you want to read it? Who will be your target audience? And who within that audience do you hope to influence? So you might have a super amazing paper where you have got multiple replicates across multiple animals at multiple places and you've had some academic advice that suggests you should publish this in some really highfalutin journal really high impact factor everybody's going to read it and that's brilliant but out of all of those people that read it are they going to actually implement it into what you see and what you do with animals in the future so impact factor is not the only measure of the quality of a journal. We must make sure that we publish in areas that are reaching the people that will make a difference, will put into practice what you have done and make a difference to the things that we work with. And just like Andrew said, with the sharing of data and using data repositories and having these digital identifiers on our work, the more open access we make our work, the more people will find it 
the more we are egalitarian in how we do science and the more the field will evolve and change. So impact is not what is the most premier paper that I can possibly publish in. Impact is also who is going to get access to this, who is going to read it and who is then going to use my work for a wider benefit. So many of you are familiar, I hope, with the key principles of the scientific method. This idea that we ask a question, we try to answer that question. It normally leads to more questions. We do some more testing and investigation and we try to draw some conclusions. But it's really worthwhile just thinking about this for a moment in terms of how do we structure our experimental designs? How do we go about collecting information? so that when we do share our data, when we do put our data into these open access repositories, or when we do write a paper, others can clearly see the quality of that data and can understand how it was collected. So you need to think about the gap in the literature, the thing that you would like to find out, the question that is there that forms the basis of your overall research project. And that doesn't have to be something groundbreaking. You don't have to solve climatic change or cure cancer or something like that. But it's got to have a formulated question that you would like to answer. And therefore, your literature review must support that question. Avoid going off on tangents. Avoid putting in information that you think is just interesting. Be a really brutal self editor of your work. I hate reading my own papers. And I would stab in the dark that Ricardo and Andrew are exactly the same. Once you have written something, you just cringe when you read it back again. But it's really important to do that to make sure that the evidence that you have is relevant to what you're trying to say. And do please remember the best way to check how you have supported your question is to do some writing, walk away from your computer and come back with some fresh eyes. The human brain, when you are tired and when you have worked for a long period of time on the same thing, will read what you want to see, not what is there. That's why fresh eyes and self-editing are super important. So plan and think about deadlines, when you want to submit, who you would like to proof your work and make sure that you're not rushing and you're not doing this review of the literature at the last minute. So what you have on paper is exactly what you want to say. Make sure your hypotheses are testable and feasible. For quantitative research, we would normally have our alternative experimental hypothesis and then a null statement that we are trying to disprove. And also, if you do qualitative research, you might not have the null and alternative hypotheses, but you might have a general question that you would like to add some evidence to, something that will guide the way in which you present your data analysis. And you should reach out, try to find some help, look at subject experts in the field that are doing quantitative or qualitative study on the area of research that you're interested in. So you know how to write out your predictions, so you know how to write out your research question, and then you can choose the right type of testing. Because ultimately, how people follow your methods and how people can replicate what you have done will depend on the clarity and consistency of your experimental design. It must be fully described, it must be repeatable, and it must be written in a way that supports how you have tested your data, because ultimately, the data quality you have will depend on your methods. It is always best to think about your experimental design and your data analysis at the same time. Because what we like to do is think about these are my methods and these methods will allow me to collect that type of data. Therefore, if I have these types of data, I will then choose these types of statistical tests. It is generally less good to try to work out some kind of fudge with your testing because you don't necessarily know what your data are going to look like. So the method should be a bigger picture. The method should be sketched out, examined, 
in terms of what data are you likely to get? And then you can work out, well, these types of tests are better. And this is a direct reflection on the validity of your methods. The results that you get are going to be based on how you implemented data collection. Run a pilot study, look in the literature and check for any precedent that's around. Don't reinvent the wheel. If you are using a particular scientific methodology that others have already worked on. So, for example, for my own PhD, where I use social network analysis on a particular group of zoo animals, at the time there was a lot of work on social network analyses in the agricultural industries. So, I chose an agricultural model in terms of how behavioural data had been collected and what types of analysis had been run, and I lifted that and I applied it to the zoo. It is not plagiarism to use the methods of others so long as it is cited appropriately. So long as you ensure that whenever you have described and defined methods that are already published, you say where that's come from, you give a citation, you include that paper in your reference list, and then most importantly, you explain any adaptations or changes to that method that you have made for your own study system. Because even though you might be using something very similar, your animals, your participants, your way of doing that research is going to be slightly different from what was originally published. And therefore, any conclusions you draw from your data, from those results that you present, should ultimately be grounded in what you've actually found out. Never overstretch your conclusions. Never assume things that are not supported by your data. And don't put in personal opinion or suggestion in your discussion that is a concluding statement that's not supported by your data. Your conclusions are there to say clearly what you have found out and why it's important. Within your discussion itself, you would explain research extensions, new ways of approaching your project, ways in which other people can do your types of science in the future, but everything must be grounded in how you have answered your question. And I was given a brilliant piece of advice when I did my own PhD which was to know when to stop writing. And I remember somebody saying to me that you never actually finish a PhD. And this applies to not just PhD research, this applies to any scientific uh, piece of work, in, in my opinion. You never really finish a PhD, you abandon it at the least critical moment because it gets to a point when you've got to stop. You've got to stop interpreting, you've got to stop discussing, you've got to stop evaluating. You've got to know when can I conclude when I when can I conclude as best possible from what I found out that's credible to the data that I have collected and the methods that I have employed. So this all brings together this idea of being clear, writing out our methods and acknowledging the work of others to be both repeatable and reproducible. This idea that if we work together, if we collaborate, if we use the works of others that have been peer reviewed, if we talk to advisors, experts, professionals in the field and we seek advice, we don't work in a silo. We ensure that we are building research relationships with others. We are able to change what seems to be this very dubious world of publication at the moment, which again, Andrew gave a brilliant example of that has destroyed someone's whole academic career. And we we get rid of the reproducibility crisis where people are reading papers and are being unable to repeat the methods and to reproduce findings. So if you are unsure as to what it means by being repeatable and being reproducible, I've just popped um, a couple of definitions on this slide here. So to be repeatable means can you get similar results each time you repeat your methods? When you do something, do you find the same sort of trends, patterns and data? Are you getting the same characteristics in your data set when you repeat your methods? And this verifies any relationship between variables and it removes the element of chance. 
it makes your data set stronger and more valid because your methods have been tested. We've shown them to work in practice in that study system. So methods must always be fully described to make sure they're repeatable. In terms of being reproducible, this is when others will take your work, they'll implement your methods, and ideally they will get results of a similar nature. They're not going to get the same findings. If you looked at one flock of sheep in one field and one flock of sheep in another field, you might not get the animals behaving in exactly the same way. But eyeballing those data and a rule of thumb approach to what you have seen is going to suggest that being reproducible has allowed you to get very similar results. So this means that the results of your research are not just an artefact of your situation. Those results are something that has come clearly from how you have measured whatever variables you're interested in from your participants. So both being repeatable and being reproducible are only possible when methods are fully described in a logical, clear and consistent manner. And in the zoo, sometimes we get examples of people saying that we can't really be uh, reproducible and we can't really be repeatable in our zoo science because our samples are small. And I don't agree with that because I think small sample sizes and case studies really allow us to move the field forward. Yes, we might see differences between animal populations in zoos, but ultimately if we collect that information and we use that information and then we gather together all of that science and we broaden our data sets in exactly the same way as Andrew said, as sharing data in repositories so it can be put together in a consistent way. If people are using the same approaches to collect those data, we expand on those small samples. And zoos and aquariums are fantastic places to do science. We have a wide variety of species that we cannot also find in the wild in accessible populations. We can't always find these animals to do science on. And we know that the wild is changing and that sometimes we might have better conditions in zoos that allow animals to show us aspects of their ecology that might be very challenging to do in the field. So approach your case study with the same rigour as if it was some multi-institutional clinical trial where everything is controlled. Small is not bad in this regard. Consider the interpretation of your findings so you don't overstretch what you're trying to say. Remember to ground your conclusions in the data that you actually have. But also remember to not assume that your animals will act in the same way as all others. A case study on one group of animals at one zoo means you know a lot of things about those animals at that one zoo, but you don't necessarily know about all of the animals in all of the populations at every other zoo. So that's where in your discussion with your research extensions, you explain what you would do further, how you would add more clarity to your outcomes, collecting more data from wider populations and extending the reach of your case study to other places. And do choose your statistical testing wisely. Sometimes simple statistics are bad. <laughs> that, that's just diluted my point completely. Sometimes simple statistics are best. Apologies, I told you I was working on a strange time frame. So you don't always have to do a regression. You don't always have to do some complex modeling. T-tests, Mann-Whitney, chi-squared, on small sample sizes where you're just trying to find is there any difference between individuals or conditions are really good because if you think about all of the um, requirements of a complex model, if you want to do some enormous, complicated, multifaceted ANOVA, you might not fulfill all of the requirements, all of the assumptions of that model with a small sample size. So come along to events like the Biasa Research Conference uh, that we run every summer where you can get further help and advice on doing research. You can also then interact with members of the research committee that do this thing on a daily basis. Seek help on the Biasa website. We have a research section on the Biasa website and look in the scientific literature. Look at what other people have done. 
see how they've approached their statistical analysis, see how they've chosen their tests and mirror that. If a paper has been published with data on a particular uh, question that's been analysed in a particular way, yes, the peer review process is not flawless, but it gives you some confidence that that way of testing has been reviewed and therefore it's likely to be credible. So make sure you're always clear in what you write and know why you're writing it. This is why this review process is so important. What am I trying to say? What story am I telling to the reader? Have a narrative in your work. State your research question and structure your literature review around it. Clearly explain the aim, what you want to achieve and your objective, how you will achieve it. And then give your predictions, your hypotheses that you'll support or refute with your data. Ensure your methods are correct for what you hope to test and make sure that what you have put into your methods is true. Don't say you have done something when actually you didn't. Be honest if there are things that went wrong, things that you forgot to consider. That's what your discussion is for. And always be careful if you're going to say something like, this is the first paper to investigate this, or this is the first paper to find that. Because I would bet my very limited life savings that there's a surefire way to somebody to come and metaphorically knock on your day and say, on your door one day and say, oh, hello, I did this many years ago. Here it is in this project. So does it really matter that it's the first paper to find that? Or do we go back to Isaac Newton and we add to that collective knowledge that's already there and we do this science so everybody can benefit? And please make sure that you get permission from everyone involved before you publish. That is other co-authors, other people that have collected data, people at the zoo that manage the animals, anybody that gave approval for the study. Reach out to them when you've got your final draft and say, this is what I've written. Would you like to be involved? If they've done a substantial amount of work to the paper, they'd be a co-author. If they have only assisted with the project, they would be in the acknowledgements. But make sure you don't publish without people knowing what you're doing. The zoo, aquarium, safari park, whoever has a right to know what's being written about the science that was conducted in their animal collection. It's always best to be open and honest with how we are presenting our science. And again, that makes it more objective and unbiased. So do seek advice from others. It's essential that you know your methods. Ethical review is a core foundation of scientific practices. And ultimately, the aim of ethical review, seeking help and looking for feedback on your methods, protects you as a researcher, it protects animal welfare, and it protects the institution's reputation as well. So it adds to the scientific credibility because others can see that those methods have been reviewed and considered and developed, not as a standalone silo by one person, but more broadly from others in the same discipline. It makes you a better person if you take on board feedback and you put that into the science that you're doing. And last but by no means least, if you are going to publish, please take care with journal selection. There are lots of predatory journals out there. If you get embedded in the field, if you work in the field in the future, do a PhD, a postdoc, something like that, and you get an academic email address, you will find that these journals will send you emails going, hey, publish here, quick turnaround, no open access fees, get your science out there really quickly. And they are soliciting you to publish with them because they are for profit. They are trying to get more money to keep their business going. There's some excellent examples out there of research um, organisations giving advice on what predatory journals are. The think, check, submit approach is really, really good. Simply Google this and you will find all of the information on it. But also think about the title of the journal. If you get one of these unsolicited emails, Think about the title of the journal itself before you consider publishing. If the title of that journal is something like medicine and biology, 
and they say we really want to publish your study on lizard enrichment that would ring alarm bells in my head that that was probably one not particularly credible and two who is their audience because medicine and biology is really broad it will be damaging to long-term reputations if you uh, consistently publish in predatory journals. So do some research, ask for help and check that what you are doing falls within the remit of the journals that you are thinking about putting your work into. And another thing you can do is look at the submission and acceptance rates of those journals. If the time between a paper being submitted and being published is let's say three weeks to a month, then again that should ring alarm bells because that's not going to give enough time for rigorous and credible review of papers. So please do take care with this. It's a bit of a minefield. Reach out and ask for help. If anybody comes to you and says, hello, I want your work in my journal, do a bit of digging before you say yes, because that can have long term ramifications for your credibility as a researcher. So as I said, there's lots of help available from Biasa. There's the research resources uh, section of the Biasa website, and there's also help from the wider community as well that you can engage with at events like this one um, and events like our summer conference, which this year is being hosted in uh, the beautiful city of Cork in Ireland at Photo Wildlife Park. So read widely, hone your skills in prep, planning, execution and impact, check what you're doing, know your sources, be clear in your methods, and you will add good quality science to this broaden, broadening approach of um, zoo research outputs that we all benefit from. So hello everyone, I'm Ricardo. I'm a lecturer and conservation project manager at Bristol Zoo. And today I will be talking a little bit about the management and logistics of zoo research projects. I will be focusing on multi-zoo studies, but many of the things that I'll be talking about also apply to zoo research in general. Even if you're just working with a single zoo or a couple of zoos, many of these things will still apply to those projects. Little overview before I start. So I will be talking about challenges and logistics of multi-zoo studies. I will be talking about the importance of planning and being prepared, which sometimes we forget about, but it's really, really important. I will be giving uh, some top tips for successful collaborations, research collaborations with zoos. And I will be giving a bit of a side note about publishing non-significant data and why it's valid and important. Starting with why should we uh, engage in multi-zoo studies? Why should we conduct multi-zoo studies? Now, Paul already touched on case studies and uh, small sample sizes, and I couldn't agree more. I'm big fan of a good case study that can be very useful, very informative, but there are situations where it's really useful to have a bigger sample size, to have more animals and more zoos on board. And a good example is for comparative studies. So when you want to um, compare um, all the differences across zoos, because as Paul also mentioned, zoos will be different in terms of husbandry, management, um, even climate, the weather, the temperature, all of that uh, may vary across zoos, but we can use do to compare 